Um, so let's focus in on those that you think will be most disrupted by artificial intelligence. What industry or industries will be? Well, it's a great question. And there are just so many. I don't think you can just say two or three. I will say any job where your primary function is sitting at a keyboard typing into something, you're going to be uh, you're going to be on the short list. There's just so many automations and so many streamlining functions that the current generation of generative AI have have built that, you know, everything from teachers to bank tellers to accountants, every single person is going to see some feature of their job change. And that's certainly uh, one of the concerns that uh, many people see when they think of AI, correct? Whether or not it will be taking their jobs. But also, the, there's an ethical side to all of this, which has been brought up numerous times. Can, can you go through some of the ethical implications of AI? Well, one of the biggest things that people are using AI for nowadays is to automate tasks that had historically been done only by people. And so when you take that decision making away from a person, let's say to get a mortgage, all of a sudden you have all sorts of questions. If the AI is trained only to maximize profit, will it be discriminatory, for example, or, or you know features like that? And so there are tremendous ethical questions once you start removing people from the decision making process with these large scale automations. Elon Musk put it so mildly to Tucker Carlson, the downside is civilizational destruction, Sultan. Uh, what's your biggest concern? Is he overplaying the downside? I, I mean, are we saying Elon Musk can be hyperbolic sometimes? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> no, I, the, the fact is, is every major technology change has disruption attached to it. We have never had a technology change that has wiped out humanity. And I tend to lean, uh, you know, trust humanity to survive. You know, cars disrupted the horse and buggy. And guess what? Horses are having better lives because of it we are going to discover that for the most part, artificial intelligence is going to make people's lives easier, make work more efficient, and make our civilization move more uh, in a more streamlined way. Now, just like that clip you showed uh, highlights, we need to have some degree of regulation so that it doesn't go out of control. But that's true with any technology, not just artificial intelligence. So what would that regulation look like? You know, it's a great question. I don't think there's a great answer just yet. You know, the European Union is putting forward some really interesting first steps on regulation. The Biden administration is not too far behind. And as a former regulator, I would really hope that we start on small, very narrow issues that define a playing field instead of saying something like you can't use AI in banking or something, uh, you know, gross and silly like that. But would the regulation come after the fact? I mean, so many times we see that something happens and then there's regulation. Or are you anticipating there be some sort of regulation uh, in the meantime? You know, I think a lot of people are trying to figure out if it makes sense to put some regulation in up front. The problem is, is regulators by nature are reactive and not proactive, especially in the United States. And I think, you know, the big conflict that we're going to see in Congress over the next uh, year or so is going to be, you know, can we get something passed through legislation that both sides can agree on? And it's not clear that we can. Yeah, let's be clear. Congress is still trying to figure out social media, let alone <laughs> cryptocurrency. So it's hard to imagine how far off actual regulation is here. I'm curious as a professor, what you tell your students, what they need to do to be ready for this next wave, to be on the edge that takes advantage of it and doesn't lose jobs because of it. Yeah, it is such a fantastic question. And, you know, especially in computer science where the tech, the tooling is just moving so quickly. You know, the other day I sat down to write my curriculum for the fall term and I used ChatGPT Chat GPT to help me. And I took what had been 10 hours of work and it took about a half hour. And if I can do that with a graduate computer science course on crypto, which is what it is, you know, just imagine what, you know, you can do in other areas. And so the one thing I tell all my students is focus on critical thinking skills, understand that both the left and the right brain have to work together. You have to understand how the technology works, but also have read some Shakespeare. And if you can focus on the convergence 
of the technology and the tools with the applied side of what you need to get ahead in life, whether it's understanding business or a specific market or being a great doctor, then you'll be in a great spot no matter what happens with the technology. Using it as a tool. And uh, can, can you talk a little bit about deciphering information that's out there when it comes to AI? I mean, are we going to have, right now there is an issue with even figuring out what is fake, what is real. Um, are we going to have even a greater issue going forward? We absolutely will. I mean, I was deep faked about a month and a half ago to show for a crypto project on a Twitter space. So, you know, it happens to all of us. And just like a few years ago, we had to start getting smart about managing our passwords for all of our logins. We're going to start having to get smarter about understanding how to look at the provenance of the things we're looking at online and understand if you see a video clip of the president giving a speech, make sure that you understand how to analyze that so you know that that is, in fact, the president giving a speech and not somebody trying to manipulate you. Wow, that is interesting. Another part of that 60 Minutes interview that really caught my eye was when um, Chat, or I guess it was Bard they were examining, wrote a paper and cited five different books as sources. Well, those books never actually existed. What are the implications of that? And, and you as a professor, again, I go back to that. What do you do to check that your work by your students is actually being done by them and not a chatbot? So it's funny, uh, about a semester, two semesters ago, I had to start adding to the tools I use. So every time I get a, a piece of homework from a student, um, I, I run it through a series of tools to look for plagiarism, which we've done for, for more than a few years now, but also running it through tools to see if a generative AI system actually built it. Um, I actually had to write a, a little program that kind of combines all of it and gives it a score. And then I, you know, I give that back to the students and say, hey, listen, you, you're probably using one of these tools to help with your research. Well, don't copy and paste that in. You know, one thing that uh, we started to do that I get a kick out of is if you remember when you're in college, those old blue books, those just pieces of you know, those little notebooks with like 20 pages in them. I've stopped uh, having students do finals online just because there's so much cheating and so much ability for these students to just copy and paste the right answers. And now they have to sit in the classroom with a pencil and actually just write down the answers without a, a laptop or anything in front of them. You can imagine the, the angst uh, that I got the first time I did that. <laughs> the old fashioned way, probably the way you and I have done that, Dave. Absolutely, yep. I'm taking notes right here, That's scribbling right. my notes. Yeah. The professor would appreciate that. <laughs> professor Sultan McGee, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. You too.